Hi, everybody. This is Tuesdays with the Bible. I'm Reverend Mary Biedren from North Congregational Church, and I'm coming to you today not only from my house, but in a recording. I'm wearing my casual clothes. It's been a couple of days off for the 4th of July for Independence Day, and I hope that wherever you've been or whatever you're doing, whether you watch this at 1 o'clock on Tuesdays or some other time, that you've had a chance to reflect and relax and restore. So, I thought that this would be a good week to answer a question that I got from a parishioner a while back about what is meant by the term, the kingdom of God. It's something that gets used over and over and over again in the Bible, in theology, when we talk about things, even in hymns. It's just a frequent, frequently occurring thing. And it is, it's a term that needs some unpacking. So the kingdom language of the Bible is in contrast with not meant to be exactly like the kingdom language of, of the rulers of Israel or any other kingdom. Um, the, the idea of kingdom is to confer righteous authority to God. And at the first, at creation, righteous authority simply existed because there was nothing challenging it. And then somehow from it is good, everything is good of creation to how we are now, things went wrong. And that story of Adam and Eve is part of the unpacking of that. What happened? How did that go wrong? Did God just abandon people? God did not. And then you have this long period of God establishing relationships with individuals until finally at the Exodus, there is an actual people, a kingdom of sorts, a, a righteous body that is united by the, the care of God. This goes on for a while, and then the people begin, as they're settled in the promised land, as they're beginning to, to forget all their old stories, begin to ask for a king. We want a king, we want a king, and the prophet Samuel takes this to God, and God says they only want a king because everybody else has a king. And and it's the God version of saying, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? But they insist and they insist, and so God says a king is going to lord it over you. A king is not going to be like me. A king is going to send you where you may or may not want to go. A king is going to tell you what to do and you will have to do it. A king is going to take your money, your taxes, and is not necessarily going to be accountable to you because that's that's what kingship is. And the people still wanted it. And so through process, first Saul, who was the the mistake king, the practice king, maybe from the tribe of Benjamin, um, he hid from the selection process, which should have been a clue. And uh, he was not able to really follow what God did. He wanted to be king, but he wanted the kingship to be completely his own. Whereas for the people of God, ultimate kingship is God's, which, by the way, is what is meant by the kingdom of God. David came next. Uh, Saul's authority was repudiated, and God had Samuel anoint David, and David was the righteous king, the writer of Psalms. He got things right. He got things wrong. He definitely abused his kingship, but he also knew how to begin to go back and make things right with God. And you see this in Psalm 51 and in many other places. So the whole idea of the kingdom of God, which becomes a goal beginning, you know, in that period of time um, when the first kings emerge, the kings along with the prophets, is a contrast to the kingdom of this world. Now, way ahead at the book of Revelation, the end of the Bible, the apocalyptic uh, vision of John of Patmos that finishes off the New Testament, there is that proclamation that we also hear every year when we hear Messiah, we hear the Hallelujah Chorus. Every word of the Hallelujah Chorus is from Revelation, and we'll get to Revelation as we kind of go through genres of the Bible um, in another few weeks. But the statement I want to lift up here is the kingdom of our Lord has become I'm sorry, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And the whole idea is that this righteous realm of God is something different. So in a lot of translations now, many of us are trying to, to tend towards something that um, 
is different from kingship because the contrast with kingship is not a an active daily process. And it's not like, are you going to serve this king or that king? Instead, it is what kind of realm are you going to serve? What kind of manifestation of God in the world are you willing to follow? And so the idea of the righteous realm of God bases God's, God's rule not on power of a king to have armies, to take taxes, to send you out, but instead names the righteous authority of God, not in hierarchy or power, but instead in love. And this is something that Jesus came and proclaimed most distinctly when he said, the kingdom of God is at hand, it is here right now. He was not talking about some hierarchical process where God is on top and we are at different places, but instead he was talking about a kingdom that comes into this world that's already here and we are slowly having it revealed to us. We are slowly having it made apparent. And so he compared the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, one little tiny teeny weeny seed to create a huge tree that grows and where birds nest, one little bit of yeast that can raise the whole batch of dough, a precious thing, a precious pearl, a pearl of great price that a man finds in a field and he sells everything else that he has to gain this pearl. The kingdom of God is worth everything. The righteous realm of God is calling to us to recognize it here on earth as well as off in heaven um, after death or wherever we perceive it. And it's saying that this is the world made right again. This is the world where grace and reconciliation and compassion are the rule instead of power and might and, and, and um, warfare and victory. Instead, the victory of Christ comes after the greatest defeat you could possibly imagine being tortured to death. And yet he rises from the dead to create this new way of being together with God. And so we have the righteous realm of God that Jesus discusses during his lifetime in his teachings. And then we have what I and others want to call the commonwealth of God which comes post-resurrection into our time, as well as into the time of the book of Acts and beyond, the time of Paul, a commonwealth begins to speak to the mutuality, to the relationality. Now, we do have commonwealths in this country. We have the commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We have the commonwealth of Virginia. They don't mean the same thing that, again, they might have once meant, but the idea of commonwealth, that everything is shared, that this is where all the resources are available to everybody, where when there is enough, everyone has, where we share, where we take care of our neighbor more carefully even than we take care of ourselves. When we begin to see that in God's perception, in God's creation, the way that we discover our own salvation, so to speak, is by caring for one another. That, that is why we're here. That is what we are here to do. And the more that we do that, the more we begin to discover God's presence right here on earth, the presence of the kingdom of God and the possibility of that kingdom. Now, it's still a difficult thing. It's difficult for us to feel our way into it because we as human beings are very transactional. We believe that cause and effect is the rule of, of life, and in many cases it really is for us. And we also have wired into our animal natures the idea of, of, of clutching on and holding on to and hoarding necessary resources. We have a preference for our family or our tribe or the people who are just like us over against the other, and we will create an other in order to make our own selves strong. But all of these things are not the kingdom of God. This is our human nature that God is trying to help us transcend so we can understand the workings of God's spirit within our spirits, within the part of us that is made in the image of God. And so... The commonwealth of God calls us to share resources, to share love, to understand that until all are free, as I said in church last this past Sunday, that we are freed for freedom's sake, and that that means that our job as those who have been freed is to free others, is to work till everyone has what they need, till everyone has their resources. Because in a commonwealth, we are not all lifted up until we are all lifted up. And so... We have this challenge 
to live in ways that may sometimes go against our sense of righteousness. I earned this. Why can't I have more than this other person? And instead understand that if we got what we deserved in the economy of God, we would all be completely condemned. None of us is perfect, not from the best person to the worst. Is there a person who has ever lived who has managed to completely transcend the, 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 the nature of our human selves, except possibly Jesus, and even he had his moments where he reacted and responded in anger and some other things. Um, but what we're really looking at here is that we are called to begin to live into these values, these goals, these common values, this commonwealth. We are called to enact grace, the grace, the love that we have received before we ever earned it, before we ever deserved it, freely given, never taken back, always present, and begin to live out that truth. Now, at the founding of this nation, this nation was founded by people who had a philosophical interest. They were not all Christians. Some of them were what we call deists, and they had a very different view, and maybe someday I'll unpack that, but not today. But what I want to say is they did have a vision of the world as God intends it, a vision where uh, care of one another could be supreme, that we are created equal. Now, they didn't really live like all people were created equal, did they? Many of them were slaveholders and many other things. This is an ideal. This is the pearl of great price that we're always seeking and striving for. This is the mustard seed that has to sprout and grow. And our job is not to be a finished work, but instead to be a work in progress and to allow God to work in our spirits. So when you throw out the first hot dog of summer onto the grill or the hamburger, when you are watching the fireworks, when you are enjoying yourself, however you choose to spend the 4th of July, thinking about the values of our country, I want you to also think even further into the values of the commonwealth of God, to God what it is to live into God's righteous realm, to recognize the authority, the kingship of God in the kingdom of God. It is there for us. It is waiting for us. We will not be denied entry. Every sincere soul will be forgiven, but we have to make the first step. We have to turn around and recognize its presence. And so my wish for you, my friends, this day and every day, is that you will perceive the presence of the kingdom of God and its possibility for all the people of God in the love, the grace, the reconciliation and compassion of God and in the work that we respond with as God's own people. And so may God be with you till we meet again.